Welcome back. Hope you had a good break, good 10 minutes. We'll try to give you 10 minutes every hour uh, so that you can uh, breathe in and uh, uh, relax from having a C++ wash over you. In, in this module, we're going to get into programs that actually do something. I think that'd be a, a good idea. So uh, we'll talk about uh, how control moves through your application and how you can disrupt that. And we'll also talk about one of the big sources of punctuation in C++ operators. And uh, right from the beginning, we also want to introduce to you the value of the standard library and some types that come from the standard library that will be helpful to you in your applications. In order to do that, we have to introduce a C++ concept known as namespaces that really uh, arise from its long history of being used by lots of different people for lots of different purposes and to make sure that people don't uh, land on each other's names for things. And then we're going to talk about a keyword called const, which is very close to both of our hearts and which, frankly, too many people are like, chapter 21, const. Uh, we'd like you to know about it from the very get-go. So let's start with a flow of control, and specifically with two keywords in C++ called if and for. You know, this is standard for any application that you're going to write, that you're going to have decisions to make. If you're writing a game, you need to say, well, if the character's hit points have gone down below zero, then draw him falling down dead, that kind of thing. And you syntax in C++ is lowercase if, round brackets or parentheses, they're not optional, and uh, then what it is that your condition is going to be based on. After the if, you can have an open brace, what to do if that condition works out true, and a close brace. After the close brace, you may have an else, which is another all lowercase keyword, an open brace, what to do when the condition is not true, and then a close brace. You don't have to have an else, so it could be like, you know, if he's dead, he falls down. If he's, you know, uh, and otherwise, you know, we're just going to carry on with the rest of the program. But you may have a, a one or the other situation. The if is the real building block of most of the decisions in your application when you need to decide which uh, course of action to take. The other building block is to do something over and over again. And, and uh, you know, you'll hear this all day. There's lots of ways to do this. <clears throat> There's at least three ways. No, at least four ways to do something over and over again. We'll start with the for loop that you see here on the screen. This is a little tricky for people to learn at first, so I want to kind of dissect it with you for a moment before you see it in a demo. The keyword is for. Again, all lowercase. All C++ keywords are always all lowercase. The round brackets, not optional. And then there are three pieces in there, and those three pieces have semicolons between them. A really popular beginner mistake is to put commas between them. And that is not an error that you think it's a, it's a mistake, but it's not an error because comma is a legitimate piece of C++ punctuation. You just don't get the result that you want. So uh, very important to remember to use semicolons between these three pieces. The first piece is how to get started. The second piece is how to know whether you're done yet or not. And the last piece is how to move on uh, so that you're going to go through the loop and do something over and over again. And just as with the if, you use braces uh, around the stuff you want to do each time through the for. And then uh, we have a while, which is essentially just like a for, but it only has the condition part. So it's up to you to do the initialization and also to do whatever moves you on to it being the next time around through the loop. Other than that, while and for have no significant difference, only a, a syntax difference. So I think these are easiest to understand by watching the debugger step through some code. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. Absolutely. So what we have here in this code editor window, there we go, is um, a simple program. So I'm actually just going to, we're not going to walk through it first. We'll just build it and step through it in the debugger. So you can see here that we have two integer local variables, x and y, and we've initialized one to the first to 2 and the second to 0. So then we have an if statement. And in here, we check if x is greater than 3, then we'll increment y. So we'll add 1 to it. Uh, otherwise, we'll remove 1 from y. Um, when we hover over x, uh, this is another feature of the debugger, is the uh, it'll actually show you what its current value is. So right now, we can see it's 2, which is as we expected, because that's what we initialized it to. Um, and we know that 2 is less than 3. I think. So it's not greater than anyway. Yes. Um, so we're not going to take this first branch of the if block. We'll use the else branch. So uh, if we step over, we'll see that indeed we've entered into the else block and we'll change the value of y. So y is now negative 1. So then we have a for loop here. 
And this for loop uh, is going to count from i equals 0. So we're going to initialize i to have the value of 0. i is a common loop variable. And uh, if you have nested loops, often people use i, j, k. And if you get any more than that, then you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, you're you should, doing something yeah, wrong. Yeah, it's not good. Um, so we're going to loop as long as i is less than x. So it's important to know that this is, this is not the condition uh, when we stop. So this is the condition we will loop as long as this is true. Um, and each time through the loop, we will increment i. So we're basically counting from i equals 0 to i equals 2. I don't think we've shown that plus plus operator before. I don't think we have, no. So um, this plus plus operator uh, is actually equal to this. So there's no difference between the two of them. Um, it's just a shorthand no notation, and it, it comes in very handy uh, in many cases. The very name of the language is a, is a joke based yes. on this, uh, that you take the language C and you increment it and make it a little bit bigger or better. And yep. uh, it's really vital. You see this plus plus an awful lot uh, in our applications, and that's all it is. It just bumps it up by one. And minus minus is the opposite. It subtracts one. Um, so we can step through here. So we've entered the loop for the first time. So the value of i is 0. It's important to note that this increment happens at the end of the loop body. Uh, and we'll uh, maybe see an example of that in a moment. Um, and we can step over this. And so you can see we're printing out numbers. You know, we're printing out the value of i each time through the loop. So at the end there, i was 2. And so we can see that we've printed 0 and 1. And then when i equals 2, it was no longer less than x, so we broke out of the loop. And that's a really common C++ idiom. To go from 0 to less than x means to go x times. Yes. You know, so we, we went through that loop twice, once for 0 and once for 1. And we are a zero-based language, and that's how we go through things. And if we go through something five times, it'll be for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Not, yep. not for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's not us. Indeed. So here we have a while loop, which is uh, effectively the same. Basically, a for and a while loop can accomplish all of the exact same things. Um, so here we're going to loop as long as x is less than 4. So we're going to step into the loop. x is currently 2, so it's obviously less than 4. Now we have another variable here, j. It's important to note that um, so local variables like these are constrained by their scope, which is defined by these braces. So the braces uh, in which local variables are defined uh, specify where you can use them. So for example, we could not use j out here. We certainly couldn't use it here before we, you know, we, we declared it. We also couldn't use it here before it's declared, even though we're in that same set of uh, braces. So the scope of j is from the point where it's declared up until the brace that ends it. These braces are called what's, uh, are what's called a compound statement, and they, they basically just group statements. So each of these is a statement here, and these braces here just say, ah, oh, this is a, a set of statements that we want to treat as a group. Uh, so that's why we put them after most loop bodies or most loop headers. So we've added 2 to x, so it now has a value of 4. We come back up. We check the condition. x is no longer less than 4, so we break out. Here um, we're showing, so that plus plus operator that we talked about, uh, there's actually two different forms of it. Uh, you can have plus plus uh, at the end of the x, or you can have plus plus uh, before the x. Um, they have the same effect on x, so both of them increment x. They both add 1 to the value of x. The difference is what the value of that expression is. So, you know, you might say, oh, well, x plus plus, it's, you know, you would never use the value. But um, you can actually uh, take that and, you know, use its value to assign another variable. So x plus plus um, increments x but then it yields the original value of x. Plus plus x increments x, and it yields the new value of x. So for example, we can step over here. We're going to you know, do x plus plus and assign the value to y. And we're going to see that y has the value of 4, which was the old value of x, and x has the value 5, which is the new value. Similarly, if we again increment x, then x will have the value 6. And we expect here y will also have the value 6, because we're using the pre-increment form. And indeed, thankfully, that's what happened. I now, if this freaks you out at all, and it does freak some people out when they first get started, just don't ever use it, uh, the plus plus operator, not just on a line of its own. That is, we could have easily written y equals x, and then on a new line, x plus plus, or the other way around. And if you're 
don't want to remember which side of the variable the plus plus goes on, just do it that way. Just put them on separate lines, and then you'll be really clear about what you're after. Uh, but it's important to mention it to people because otherwise they get very confused. Oh, and what's the most important rule of Stack Overflow C++ questions? Don't increment, don't plus plus the same variable twice on a, on a line and then write me a Stack Overflow question asking why it's being weird. <laughs> right? I don't. Like, like y equals x plus 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 x plus plus. Oh, that's a, yes. That's so, a bad thing. As a general rule of thumb, uh, just avoid modifying multiple things in a single statement. Just make yes. sure that every every statement, you may modify one thing at a time and you're you're totally safe. You don't have to worry about it. Exactly. So here, this is this is questionable because we're modifying both y and x. So just in general, try and avoid doing that. And your code I, I will be agree. much cleaner, easier to understand, easier to debug. That's right. You put them on separate lines. If you want to set y to the value of x first, then have a line that says y equals x first. We're showing you these lines of code because you may be asked to read other people's code, and you're going to bump into this sort of thing. And, and modern C++ you know, doesn't try to pack everything into one line and one statement and one expression. It tries to be more sane, readable. I Perhaps, yes. <laughs> um, but if nothing else, if you forget, you can always load it up in the debugger, step through it, and you can see exactly what's happening. And that's often an effective way not only to you know, debug code if you, if you want to try and understand what's going on, but also to learn the language, you know, to just write things and, and say, oh, how, what is happening here? Right. Um, so after that, uh, we now have another um, type of control flow statement that Kate didn't mention. It's called a switch. So a switch uh, looks at the x, or looks at whatever expression it's given, and um, it takes its value, and it has different cases that it can do for each of the values. So for example here, if x is 4, we'll, we'll enter this case. If x is 5, we'll do this case, and so on. So x is 6, so we're going to end up jumping into this, um, this case 6, and indeed, and then we'll see in the output window that we printed x is 6. If x was none of those values, like um, if x had a value of, say, 20, uh, we would enter what's called the default case. And so here we would have printed out that it's, you know, it's not one of those values. Um, you don't have to have a default case, uh, in which case if it doesn't match any of the existing cases, it'll just skip over the whole switch statement. It won't do anything. Uh, so that's not an error. So you could have built this out of a whole pile of ifs. You could have, yes. But when you use a switch statement, you're sort of telling the people who read your code, I'm really only expecting one of these things to happen. So even though you see several ifs in a row, I'm really just trying to figure out uh, one thing to do. Whereas normally when you see five ifs in a row, anywhere from zero to five of those things could actually happen. The case statement, switch statement, makes it clearer your intent. I, again, if you don't want to learn a switch statement on day one, just use a bunch of ifs, and, and later you can start using switches. Mm -hmm. So then finally, um, we have, this is not a control flow statement, it's just another form of expression is this funny uh, question mark thingy, as a former colleague of mine uh, <laughs> referred to it. Um, and so this is called a conditional expression. And what it does is it has three parts. This first part here is a condition. So it'll test this condition and it'll say, oh, you know, is this true or is it false? So in this case, the debugger helpfully tells us, hey, this is true. If it's true, then it'll evaluate this middle piece, the piece between the question mark and the colon, and it will um, it'll it'll yield that result. If it's false, it'll do this this ten piece here, or the piece after the colon. So if we step over, we'll see that x indeed gets the value of five because y is greater than five was true. Um, I guess can I show one more feature of the debugger that is helpful sure. to people? All right. Um, so there's another handy feature of the debugger that if you want to repeat something, uh, if you want to like go try and go back and you know try something again, uh, you can drag this little arrow. Oops. Yes. Um, and move it to say, I want to do this piece again. Now, you have to be very careful because, you know, if you've changed something later on in the function, then is this moving the arrow isn't magically going to undo anything that you did in the function. It's not um, a time machine. <laughs> right. Uh, but So one of the advantages here is you can also, in this watch window, um, you can actually change the values of variables. So, for example, we could set y equals 0. And now if we add a watch again on y, oops, if I can type, uh, then we'll see it now has a value of 0. Um, so now this expression y is greater than 5 is false, uh, so x is going to get the value of 10 instead of the 5. So this is a really handy thing, especially when you've got you know little values or integers or you want to go and repeat a loop. Um, and if you have well-structured code, then 
you'll often find that it's really easy for you to just go back and repeat a function and, and call it again and say, oh, wait, what's going on here? So that conditional operator uh, is a more compact way to do something that you could do another way. You could have written if the condition x equals the first value, which was 5, else x, it equals the second value, which was 10. But that would take, ooh, five, six lines in the code editor, and, uh, and many, especially uh, uh, older school developers, were really happy to have that single line. But it also, there's a sort of a burden if you're looking at an if and an else, where you have to go through and say, ah, oh, both the if and the else change the value of the same variable. You're just trying to figure out what value to assign to it. And so in some ways, that conditional operator can actually be more expressive than the if and the else. Absolutely. Because it makes it clear that no matter which condition happens, we're going to change the value of the target. And so in, that's worth learning about and learning how to tell people how to read your code. Yep. All right. We showed you several operators in that demo, and most of the time you don't even notice them. You can just read them. You know, if you want to um, add two numbers, you, you use the plus. No, really? <laughs> X is equal to 1 plus 2. I, I wonder what that does. And so the C++ operators kind of start simple like that. They lull you into a false sense of security, I feel. So we have uh, plus, minus, star for multiply, and slash for divide. Many people go looking for the operator that means to, to the power. So x squared, x, insert some punctuation here, 2. There is no punctuation for power of. There's a function. We'll, we'll talk about functions very shortly, but there is not uh, an operator for that. Then we have uh, plus equals and his cousins minus equals, times equals, and divides equals, which I don't think get used very often. I use plus equals and times equals quite a lot. In our demos, we've had really, really simple variable names like i and x. And it's really easy to write i is equal to i plus 2. But what if the variable was called uh, tomorrow's shipping limit? And I needed to write tomorrow's shipping limit equals tomorrow's shipping limit plus new additions. <sighs> And maybe some of it would roll off the end of the screen, especially the smaller screens of long ago. So the plus equal operator just saves you from having to repeat the variable name twice. So i plus equals 2 means exactly the same thing as i is equal to i plus 2. It's just a convenience. We talked about uh, plus plus and minus minus in their beginning, before and after versions. And you saw the greater than being used for comparison. There's greater than, less than, and as well as greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. I don't see a lot of use of greater than or equal to or less than or equal to by C++ programmers. It's purely an idiom. If we want to do something uh, five times, we'll start at zero and go till it's less than five. It would be exactly the same to go until it was less than or equal to four. We, we just don't do it. I mean, it's not wrong. Uh, it's just the way we happen to express ourselves. The equals c comparison, that is, is x equal to y? This one trips up people who've come from some other languages. You have to press two equal signs. If you only press one equal sign, you will actually be changing the value of x to the value of y, which is probably not what you wanted. Uh, and if you want to compare that things are not equal, it's the exclamation mark equal sign. So I've heard that JavaScript uh, has something with three equal three signs. Three equal. Do we so have, do we have no, anything like that? We no, don't. no, we so don't. So no one can ever complain about our punctuation. OK, we excellent. Have three equals, yeah. And we also don't have a different operator for like case-sensitive and non-case-sensitive comparisons and that kind of thing, too. <laughs> we, so we, yeah, we could be worse. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, the standards committee might hear us and <laughs> put more punctuation in. Now, we did very simple conditions in the demo because we just wanted to focus on the words like if and for and while. But you may have uh, complicated things to do. I want to keep going as long as x is not reached 10 yet and also some other condition is true. And so we have these operators for combine, combining conditions. They are doubled up. That is, if you want to say and, you have to press the ampersand key twice. If you want to say or, you have to press the or bar twice. Some people are like, or bar? What's an or bar? On my keyboard, that's a capital backslash. So if you have a keyboard near you, take a look. Um, and uh, some people uh, who are even older than me will call that pipe rather than or bar, because that's the symbol on Unix and in DOS. Um, but again, there are two of them uh, when you are combining uh, two conditions to see if they're true or not. And if you would like to take the opposite of a condition, it is the exclamation mark, which we pronounce not. You'll basically see these in context and, and yep. get used to them, but there's plenty of punctuation. Yep. I think the only one, the only other one we should mention is you can also use parentheses to group things. Um, 
So there are precedence rules for oh, these. Yes. So for example, um, plus and minus have lower precedence than multiplication and division, just like in, in you know, regular mathematics. Um, and if you want to override those precedence rules, you can use parentheses. Now, there's actually precedence rules that specify how all of these group. So you could have a long string of, you know, multiply and divide and or and, um, you know, less than and greater than. Don't do that. Don't do that. Seriously, do not do that. Um, if, if you ever combine things more complex than, you know, plus or and, and times, then really use parentheses to group things to, to avoid mistakes and to make, to make the code easier to understand. For the person after you. So you may have memorized the relative uh, precedence of multiplying and greater than, but the person who reads your code may read it wrongly and uh, misunderstand what you had in mind. So uh, definitely if you're building complicated expressions, use parentheses liberally, mm -hmm. for sure. I've referred to functions a couple times. Functions are not the real building blocks of C++. Uh, that honor goes to classes and objects, but they are the building blocks of C, and C++ builds on that. You know, anytime you've got 20 lines of code to do something, add up all the items in an order and calculate the sales tax, you shouldn't just sort of copy and paste those 20 lines of code if you need them again later in your program. You should wrap them up and give them a name. And the, uh, the kids these days, agile kids and all that, love to go around saying, don't repeat yourself. And, and you know, having a function is, is a good example of being dry, of saying, I'm not going to copy and paste these lines of code. I'm going to put them in a function. The nice thing about putting something in a function is it gives it a name. And now anyone who's reading it can see it's, oh, calculates total and sales tax. I know what this code does because it's got a label on it, unlike a comment, which will probably end up being a lie later. Mm -hmm. And my favorite kind of functions, of course, are the ones that I don't have to write because they came in a library and someone else took care of them for me. Now, just as variables are strongly typed, functions are strongly typed. They have a return type, which is a lot like the type of a variable. It's one of the places where void comes in. Some languages have something like a subroutine, where it goes off and does something but doesn't return a value. And in C++, that's a function that returns void. And we just call them all functions. They're also typed in the sense of what you pass to them. So if I want to write a function that takes a number and does something to it, well, it takes a number, an integer to be specific, or a double. And it's not appropriate to give it a string or some other type. Once you get into functions having the strongly typed capabilities, you also get into the possibility that you can actually have two functions with the same name, as long as the compiler can tell them apart. One way the compiler can tell them apart is if they take a different number of parameters. Um, in theory, uh, compiler can also tell them apart if they take different types of parameters, but because the compiler loves to do conversions for you, they may not be as different as you think. But a different number of parameters is a great way to tell functions apart. So if you want to use a function, you have to tell the compiler it exists. You can either do that by giving the compiler all the code for the function to compile, or, as you'll see shortly, by just making it a promise that you keep later. So let's write some functions. All right. So what we have here is um, we have this source file. It's just called utilities.cpp. And it has a function called add to. And it takes an integer. So this is a parameter. Um, and then it takes the value that we pass into the function, uh, add to to it, and return the result. So you'll notice that there's no main function here. And as we said before, we need to have a main function for every console application. Our main function is in a different file called functions.cpp. Um, now, as Kate said, uh, you need to tell the compiler that something exists before you use it. And we do that by using what's called a declaration. So this here is a declaration. You'll see that it has no code. You know, there's no executable code associated with it. We're just saying there is a function named add to that has, you know, returns an int and takes a one int parameter. Um, this has to match exactly what is in utilities.cpp. Um, and then in main, we can call it as if it was defined here in this file. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to build it first, and then I'm going to run it. Um, and so you can see that you know, we have a local variable i initialized to 4. We call the add to function. So I'm actually going to do what's called stepping into, which will take us to that function that we're calling here. And so you can see that control has, has entered this function. We can see the value 4 is here. And then we're going to return i plus 2. And we're going to uh, uh, initialize j with that value. Now, also of important, uh, on the autos window, 
you can actually see the debugger will tell you, ah, that last function you called, it returned the value 6, which is really useful, uh, especially if you're calling a function and ignoring the result most of the time. But you really want to know, you know when debugging what the result was. So we can step over this, and we can see that j now has a value of 6. Now, there's a couple important things to note here. The first is related to scope. As we said, uh, the scope of i, like this i here, um, is constrained to, from its, its declaration here until the end of the block in which it's declared. Similarly, this int i here is completely unrelated. So they're two completely different variables. Um, and so we can call, for example, we can call add to with the variable or with the value of the variable j. So we can pass 6 in. And you can see that you know, the value of i here in this function is now 6. Now, there's something interesting here. We're not using the result of this function call. So we're just, we're just throwing it away. And we can see that after the function returned, j still has a value of 6, even though the function returned 8. So C++ is, by default, a pass-by value uh, language. And we'll see a lot more about this in the next section. But basically, any time you call a function that has like an int parameter, um, a copy of what you're passing in is passed. So there's no, uh, it's not like it's a reference to j, and so that j is actually going to be modified by the function. We'll see how we can do that later, but this is the important thing. Um, so then here we can see again that we're going to call add to with j and assign the result back to j. I see this a lot when people are uh, doing string manipulations in, in a variety of languages, not just C++. They call some function that you know, replaces all the spaces with dots. And then they say, why aren't the spaces replaced with dots? And we say, because the changed string was returned. Yes. And the same thing here, the changed integer is returned, but the one you passed in is left untouched. Mm -hmm. And we can tell that by just looking at the signature. The function takes an integer. We know that's a copy. We know it doesn't change it. By the time we're done today, you'll also uh, know how to do that. But for today, it's good to know that's a thing that happens. You know, It doesn't necessarily change what it's given. It, it might return the new value, as this one does. Yep. So if we step over the, uh, this statement here, we'll end up calling the function, and we'll see that j now has the value of 8. So. What happens if we don't tell the compiler about this function? So we can comment it out. And you'll see this is, uh, this is the form of comments in C++. We can use this uh, double forward slashes at the beginning of the line. Uh, or alternatively, we can also use uh, there's an older form of comment from C. And the advantage of this one is you can have, it can spam multiple lines. Um, but generally, we try to use the, um, the single line comment. They're easier to, to work with. So if we comment it out, we'll see that the compiler is going to complain. It's going to complain that all of these uses of add to, it, it has no idea what add to is. We might say, oh, well, but we've defined it over here, so we do know where it is. But every CPP file is compiled individually, so there's no, uh, there's no communication between the files. There's no way to tell the compiler, oh, well, the way to tell the compiler it's in another file is through this declaration Just here. to declare it. So you don't have to define it in each, in each uh, file, but you do have to declare it. Yep. Uh, can you make the error happen again? I can, I can, yes. Because I thought I'd show people the secret code that the error number starts with the letter C. Yes. So um, our compiler, the Visual C++ compiler, every error message and every warning uh, starts with a C. And it's got a four-digit code. And this is really handy because then you can go and search Bing for you know the, that error code and get a lot of information about most of the warnings and errors that we, uh, that we report. Um, so that's really helpful like, if you're like, I have no idea what this error means. And you can often go and find. And if not on uh, MSDN, then on Stack Overflow and, and other places where people have run into similar issues, you can often find solutions. Um, but the important thing here is that it starts with a C. So that means it's from the compiler. So if we build again and we put the declaration back, the, the error goes away. Recall that the compiler isn't the only piece that we're running, though. Once we've compiled the code, you know, each CPP file turns into what's called an object file with an OBJ extension. And then the compiler feeds all these objects into a tool called the linker. And the linker is a bit surlier than the, uh, the compiler. It's, he's, he's very grumpy much of the time. Um, so basically, what that declaration says is, hey, if I use this, I promise I'm going to go declare it you know, somewhere else in this file over here. So what happens if we don't declare it? So here I've removed you know, this definition from this file. 
And you'll see that we have an, an, a new error now, and it starts with LNK, and these errors are all from the linker, so the LNK is for linker. Um, and it's saying that there's an unresolved external symbol. So an external, so what this means is, hey, I really needed this add to thing, and you can see he's, he's given it this nice declaration here, so it tells you, oh, it's the add to that takes an integer and returns an integer, so you know which overload if you have overloads. Um, and it's saying, oh, well, you promised this was going to be there, and it's not there. So this almost always means that, hey, well, this always means that you've forgotten to link in some object. You've forgotten to define some function. Um, Sometimes you forgot to add a file to your Visual Studio project. That could be it. Or you just forgot to write the function. You made the promise, and you forgot to keep it. That's a popular one. Yep. And so related to that, you know, if we were to change this parameter type in the declaration only to be a double, you'll see that the linker also reports an error. Now, we still have add to defined, but it's the wrong add to. It has the wrong parameter types. So, you know, this, this can be something to look out for. You know, just make sure that your parameter types match. Make sure that um, you've actually defined everything correctly. Make sure you have all the correct files in your solution. I find that, that people who want to argue with error messages uh, will often be happier had they known what the error message was. So essentially they'll say, how dare the linker be angry? Look, I've clearly made the compiler happy. You know, I mean, that's not right. what they're saying with their mouth, but that's what they're telling me. So yep. they say, I declared the function, I made the promise to the compiler, and I made the compiler happy. But I didn't keep the promise, so now why am I getting an error message? Yep. Uh, you didn't keep the promise. Your error message is from the linker. And uh, the other way around as well, where I wrote this function, so, so why am I getting a compiler message when I try to call it? Because you didn't declare it to the compiler. Mm -hmm. So knowing where those error messages come from can really uh, take some of the frustration away of trying to understand what it takes to make your program work. And it's important to note that um, when you're writing your first programs it's and you run into errors and you don't understand them, it's probably not a compiler or linker bug. So <laughs> the compiler is software. It has bugs. Like, we're not going to shy away from that. Uh, but generally, you know, writing your first programs, you're not going to run into them. And uh, like I know on Stack Overflow when we answer questions, um, there are many people who say, ah, this is clearly a bug in the compiler. My code is perfect. And, you know, indeed there's, you know, little errors or things like that. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I almost never think it's the compiler. And, and uh, every once in a while, I'll be running maybe a community technology preview, something like that, and, uh, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll reach out to someone I know and say, what am I doing wrong? And they'll say, oh, it's not you. It's actually a compiler bug in this really, really early bits that aren't ready yeah. for public consumption. And I'm so surprised because it's never the compiler. The experienced people never think it's the compiler. <laughs> right. So I'm going to show a slightly different demo. So to start off with, it would be really inconvenient if we had to declare functions in every file that we wanted to use them in, uh, especially for common functions like, um, like this one, you know, similar utility functions. We don't want to have to copy this over and over and over again because that violates the don't repeat yourself principle that we, we said we don't want to violate. So what we can do, I think, oh. I'm sorry, I have, uh, yes, here we go. You're in a maze of twisty projects. On yes, we have a few projects <laughs> open. Um, so what you can do is use what's called a header file. And a header file uh, is, it's a source file that generally doesn't have a lot of uh, function definitions, though it may, we'll, we'll get into some advanced scenarios later. Uh, but generally it just has uh, a bunch of declarations and things that can be reused in, in every file. And then in our source files, we use that include directive that we showed off in the last module uh, to say, I want you to include that. So what happens is the preprocessor, which is that first step that we were talking about, uh, will actually take everything from utilities.h. So it'll take this one line, basically. And it will copy all, it will be as if we copied all of the contents into this file. So that way we can include it here. We can include it, you know, where we actually define the function. And this enables us to, um, to basically reuse our declaration. So we can declare everything in one place and define it in one place. Then if you were to need to change it um, to make it take a double or uh, for any other kind of change, like maybe if you have a pointy-haired boss who has a naming convention and makes you come along and uh, change names of all your functions, which I think has happened to everybody at some point, you would only need to change it in the header file. And all of the places that were including the header file would get that new information. Yep. I think that'll... I think... That, that's functions for now? Yes, I think that's it. So far, we've been uh, pretty bossy to the compiler. We've said, 
This is an integer. This is a double. Here's a function that I want you to call. And the, the compiler has sort of uh, followed along, and um, it's been a little bit like um, an assistant who knows what's going on and says, are you sure? Did you want to do that? It gives you a warning if you try to put you know, a floating point number into an integer, that kind of thing. Sometimes it gives you an error. You try to call a function that it's never heard of. But you can kind of engage the compiler as your helper, your, your external memory, by putting more information into your program and then getting it to enforce it. And one of the most important things you can say is that a particular variable doesn't actually vary, despite the name. Uh, there are languages in which nothing varies, even when it's called a variable. And then there are languages where uh, it's assumed that everything can. In C++, and this is a, a sort of a late motif for us, if we get to choose, if we want immutability, we can have it. If we don't, we don't have to. So when you mark something with this keyword const, you are saying, this will not change. Uh, none of the code you're about to compile is going to change the value of this variable. And then the compiler will actually enforce that. And if you have a line of code later that tries to change the value of something you've marked const, you'll get a compiler error, basically telling you you can't. It's const. Why would you want to do that? I think everyone's written the kind of code where we change the wrong half of something. You know, we're trying to do how many transactions have we had today, and is it the limit? And we mean to raise the number of transactions, and just in a moment of stupidity, we raise the limit. And then we're running the code under the debugger, and we can't understand it. We're never getting to the limit. The limit keeps getting bigger. What's going on? If we had told the compiler that the limit was const, then when we wrote that stupid line, the compiler would have said, are you sure? Is that your final answer? And we could have caught that mistake. And that happens all the time to me when I used const from the very beginning. If I declare something like a limit that I know isn't going to change and I immediately say that it's not going to change, then I catch myself when I make a mistake. And I think there's also some speed ups possible from that, right? Um, potentially. There's a, few there's a few places, but you shouldn't worry about performance when no, it comes to const. No, we don't want like, to premature that's optimize. Not, that's not uh, all that important. But absolutely, you should use const everywhere you can. Like If you can use const somewhere, do it. Um, this actually also encourages several uh, very good programming styles. So for example, um, in many programs, especially in legacy programs, uh, people will reuse local variables. So they might declare one i very integer at the top of a file, and then have 10 loops that use that same i. Um, loops, I guess, are a bad example, because you have to change those. Uh, but you always want to use each variable in as constrained a location as possible. Um, so generally, yes, you should try and make everything const, but then things like loop variables, um, you should you know, because they, they can't be. You should they they have to change. Yeah. We're going to go around and increment i yeah. every time through the loop. But const by default is a good rule. Const first. And uh, the reason is, if you ever come up to a program where the developer doesn't appear to have heard of const and you try to label something const for the first time, uh, well, the compiler will step up and help you. And uh, you, you, you won't really enjoy that experience very much. And I think the demo we have is actually going to show that by having to add const as we go through. Yes. All right, let's give them a, a whirl through that. Actually, we're so what we have here is we have um, just a little main function. We still have the same add to. Um, and we have, you know, this is, in, this is just like we had before. i is a regular int. But then j and k are const integers. And you can see that we can add the const either on the left or on the right. <laughs> um, there are warring factions, you know, that argue that it belongs on one side or the other. Um, but the, the important... The compiler is neutral. The compiler, yeah, the doesn't, compiler care. doesn't care. You can put it in either place. And so we initialize each of these with, you know, this, this add to expression. So all of that is fine. So then this add to is also fine because we're making a copy of the J, as we said, because it's passed by value. We're going to copy the J and we're not going to actually modify the original J. But as soon as we try to assign 2j or change its value in any way, so even if we were to say j++, that would not work. Um, similarly, for k, uh, if we were to try to just you know, assign a new value 7, that's not going to work. And if we build, we'll see that the compiler is going to report error messages. And this time, it's actually a very easy to understand message. It says, you cannot assign to a variable that is const. Um, so this is an extremely useful feature uh, for all code. Use it everywhere. Use it everywhere. When you, when you declare a variable and you think that 
you know it's going to change because this is the value I'm calculating, the total, the sales tax, whatever, then obviously don't mark that const. But most of our programs are full of numbers that are, are not going to change, and not just numbers either, variables of all types. And if you have the habit on every line when you declare something of asking yourself whether it's going to change or not, you will end up with more correct programs that are easier to maintain in the future. And before we wrap up this module, I'd like to show you uh, something that the library gives us that's very helpful, and that's types that we can use. So integer and bool and double and float and all of those are built-in language types, but C++ allows us to declare our own types, and uh, the best ones are when we say we, and it's not me or James, but some other person who, uh, for the goodness of the universe, has written some useful types and put them into a library. The C++ standard library, which most of us also call STL because um, it sort of grew out of something called the standard template library, it comes with your compiler and it has things in it that you need. Types, functions, all kinds of goodies, and they are wrapped up in something called a namespace, and specifically in the STD for standard namespace. When I first started writing in C++, there was no standard library, and I wrote a string class of my own, and I called it string. And after I'd gotten that all working and I had a program that used it, I started using someone else's library to do something more complicated. And they had a string class that was different, and uh, we had collisions and errors because I said that, that my string was like this, but their string was like something else. The compiler got mad. And, and in those days, I had to solve that problem by calling my class uh, effectively Kate string. That's a terrible solution. There's probably more than one Kate on the planet. So C++ has this thing called namespaces. You've seen namespaces in the sample code we've shown you when you saw std colon colon c out. That's calling c out by its full name because it's in the std namespace. And that's what the double colons are. It's pronounced scope resolution operator, if you care. And uh, the string type that I want to tell you about is also in the standard namespace. And it can make your uh, applications, your code, a little tough to read if you keep saying std colon colon everywhere. So if you're going to use a lot of types from the standard namespace, you can put in a directive that tells the compiler, hey, while you're compiling this, if you can't find where something is, uh, try looking in the STD namespace for it. If you want to use this, never ever in a header file. Uh, that's just a rule to keep you from being unhappy. The compiler will let you do it. We just think it's wrong. Let's show them string in action. All right. So I've got here um, a little example showing how we can use strings because you know, using programs that only have numbers are not very fun. Well, I guess for some people they're probably fun. <laughs> um, so here we can see we've just got, you know, an integer i, and it's being initialized using the brace initialization that we've been seeing so far. And we have a std string, or std string, depending on how one chooses to pronounce it. Uh, some people also pronounce it standard, so it's the standard library, it's the standard library namespace. Um, you can pronounce it however you'd like. Uh, so we have this string named hello, and we initialize it with a, the string hello. So if we step over this, we can see in the debugger that indeed it has the value hello. We can append the string using the plus equal operator. Um, and we can see that we now have, it now has the value hello world exclamation point. We can print it out just like we can print out literal strings and numbers like we've seen before. And if we look at the output window, we'll see hello world. We can also compare strings, so we can compare this hello with you know, this other string hello world. And what this will do is it'll do a character by character case sensitive uh, comparison. So it, it's not going to, you know, if we had all lowercase hello world, that would not uh, compare equal. Uh, but since these strings do compare equal, we'll see that we enter this first block of the if statement and we print out equal. Um, so that's, um, there's a lot of other operations you can do on std string. It has tons of functions to like find characters in it to uh, compute substrings so we get just the world piece of it um, to do all sorts of manipulation. But um, you can explore most of that on your own. Um, one of the important things to point out though is that std string, uh, as Kate said, is not a fundamental type. So it's not built into the language. Uh, it's, you could define it yourself. You could, everything that it can do, you could implement in your own code. Um, and this is, this is one of the coolest parts of C++, is that it has relatively few uh, actual built-in pieces, and everything gets built up on top of those. Uh, so it's a very extensible language in that point of view. 
I also like the fact that this user-defined type, although the user isn't you, it's someone who wrote the library, operates exactly the same way as the fundamental types like integer. So you don't have to call a dot equals method. You just use the equals equals operator the same as you would use to compare two integers. You don't have to use the dot append method. You use the plus equals operator the same as you would with two integers. This lowers your kind of cognitive burden of learning how to use the class. And it also makes um, less, uh, what's the word I want, thrashing around with IntelliSense where you type something and then dot and then you scroll up and down because mm -hmm. you don't think of it as append, you think of it as something else and so you're not spotting append in the list. It's very easy to spell uh, a one or two character operator like plus or equals equals, but it's also easier to remember and uh, just encourages you to think about these uh, user-defined types exactly the same way as the fundamental types. Uh, we don't really have a dichotomy uh, the way some other languages do between the fundamental types and the user-defined types. So I do want to just show one more uh, piece of this example. So as Kate said, there's this thing called a using directive. And what this does is it says, hey, everything that's in the std namespace, I want you to put in this global namespace so that we can refer to it without having to use the colon colons. So you can see now that we've done this, we've been able to remove the std colon colon from in front of string and in front of c out and in front of and l. Um, this can, so there's, there's differing views on whether this is a good idea. I happen to avoid it in all of my code. Um, it can make names shorter, uh, but in general, it can also make things a bit more confusing. So in the std namespace, there's f a function named find and a function named uh, max. And so often, you know, someone may define their own function with one of those names in the file. Uh, I know a friend of mine was a beginner learning C++, and he's like, I don't understand why my code is working. I, like, I clearly broke it, and it's still working. And I said, oh, well, you're actually calling this other function because of your using namespace std. Um, so in general, I, like, I'd highly recommend, as a beginner, avoiding it, and maybe later using it for your own namespaces. But std, there's so much stuff in it, and you never quite know exactly what you're pulling in. No, so nobody's memorized the entire content. Right. Yeah. yeah. So there is another form of this uh, called a using declaration. And so here we can do, we can say exactly what we want to pull in. And if we do this for our three entities that we're using, now the code, there's no more squiggles. And so we can say exactly what we want. And so this is sometimes useful. It is. I also find in the case of a demo that it really sort of, um, it's almost like a little table of contents. It says, here are the types from the standard library that I'm going to be using in this code. Now, if there were, you know, 50 of them, I might feel uh, less pleasure about seeing that little list. But with three of them, that makes it really clear what we're going to be exercising. Yep. Did we show the include to bring in string? Uh, I don't think we did. So. Um, here in the code, you can see that uh, we have include directives here for string and IO stream. And so these are just like our include uh, utilities.h that we had. Uh, string and IO stream are just headers that come as part of the compiler. They don't have a .h. It's for historical reasons. Um, for some reason, the standard <laughs> library doesn't use .h. I know. Um, I... The C standard library does. The C++ standard library does not. Um, but we can actually we can open these up, and it's horrifying to look upon. But um, it's, it's just a C++ source file, just like any other, with an enormous amount of code that you don't have to worry about or implement. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a header like any other. Absolutely. And so if you're trying to use standard string and it's not working, uh, make sure that you've included string uh, with those angle brackets around it to get the library code yep. brought in. And if you look at the uh, documentation of any, uh, any of the library types on MSDN, it'll actually say, oh, you need to include this header in order to use it. Um, if uh, alternatively there's a reference, a CPP reference, I believe it's called, that is yeah. a great, uh, it's an open wiki, so anybody can contribute to it, but it, it's got a great reference of types. Um, but yeah, so if you do forget uh, to include it, it may work. Sometimes um, headers can include each other, so like if we had only included IO stream, IO stream might have included uh, string, uh, which would be unfortunate because it, it's, it's, it makes it hard to find happens. errors. Yeah. But, um, Generally, you'll get an error message, and it'll be like, I don't know what this string thing is. What is, you know, there's no string in this namespace. And right. And that's just going to be exactly like when it didn't know what add2 was. And we fixed that by putting in the right header to teach it what add2 was, and in the same way you put in the right header to teach it what string is. So in this module, you've seen the sort of flow of control, how to do things conditionally, how to do things over and over, and how to write your own functions. 
And now we're really in a position to be able to start writing full-on C++ applications. We have those building blocks in place. And uh, after about a 10-minute break, we're going to talk about objects and classes. And that's what makes C++ the language that it is. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank <music> you.